Lovely. Okay, I'll let everybody in now. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Just letting the last couple of people in from the Zoom waiting room. Lovely. Let's get started. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I am currently seated, the Yagara and Turbal people. I pay my respects to elders past and present and acknowledge that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, before I hand you over to our speakers this evening for tonight's discussion of honeybee, I'd just like to quickly reiterate some of the information that I mentioned in the email you were sent earlier with your link to join tonight's event. Um, so you've all automatically been placed on mute and you'll remain so throughout the evening, but that doesn't mean that Craig isn't keen on answering your questions. He is. It will just, uh, the Q&A will just take place a little bit differently to um, how you might be used to with these events. So if you would like to ask a question, you can do so by sending them through to me via the chat box. Um, you should be able to see it towards the lower left of your screen, but if you can't, then don't worry. Um, within the next few minutes, I'll be sending the link that you can use to purchase your copies of Honeybee if you haven't already. Um, so it will pop up when I do so. If you type your questions there, then they will come straight through to me and I will read them out um, for Craig to answer later on in the evening and I'll try and get through as many as we have time for. So please start sending those through um, as and when you think of them. Um, I'd also just like to say a big thank you from myself and the rest of the team at Avid Reader for attending tonight's discussion. Um, your support means so much to us and when you purchase tickets to our events like you have done for this evening's event um, and buy books from our store, it means that we can keep, keep um, building the literary community that we um, love and are so proud to be a part of, so thank you. Um, with that being said, I also want to mention that today is Give Out Day 2020. Um, for those who don't know, Give Out Day is a national day of giving to LGBTIQ plus projects, community groups and not-for-profit organisations. And this includes many incredible publications. Um, Give Out has almost reached their goal of raising $100,000. They are just a few hundred dollars um, away from that goal. So if you are able and um, to do so and would like to um, consider donating to them so that they can um, hit that goal. I'll post that link in the chat box later on this evening as well so that you can do so. Um, and so it is now my pleasure to introduce Craig Sylvie. Craig is an author and screenwriter from Fremantle, Western Australia. His critically acclaimed debut novel, Rhubarb, was published in 2004. His best-selling second novel, Jasper Jones, was released in 2009 and is considered a modern Australian classic. Published in over, over a dozen territories, Jasper Jones has won plaudits in three continents, including an International Dublin Literary Award shortlisting, a Michael J. Prince Award honour, and a Miles Franklin Literary Award shortlisting. Jasper Jones was the Australian Book Industry Awards Book of the Year to, for 2010. And Honey Bee, which will be discussed tonight, is Craig's third novel. And in conversation with Craig tonight, we have Ben Hobson. Ben lives in Brisbane and is entirely keen on his wife, Lena, and their two small boys, Charlie and Henry. He currently teaches English and music at Bribe Island State High School. In 2014, his novella, If the Saddle Breaks My Spine, was shortlisted for the Viva La Novella Prize, run by Seizure Online. To Become a Whale, his first novel was published in 2017. And so Craig and Ben, it is now my pleasure to hand over to you both for tonight's discussion. Thank you, Emma. And uh, yeah, thank you, Craig, for joining us this evening. We are very, very appreciative, especially considering, uh, I think you were saying just before we went live that you've uh, pretty much just driven home in a mad rush to be here for us. So uh, appreciate it. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Ben. It's my pleasure. It's worth rushing home for. <laughs> um, we are, though, very sad that um, we're not meeting you in person, obviously, um, just with our restrictions. Let's not to start. Um, how have you been finding doing these author tours and going around and the uh, online version of, of, um, 
of what an author tour looks like. How has that been for you? Yeah, it's been, it's been really interesting. Um, you know, I've, I've had a crash course in how to set up cameras and, and lighting in the house here for Studio Honeybee. It's been a bit it odd. Does look, it looks really nice, I have to say, your lighting Thanks, mate. Everything. Appreciate it. Yeah. I oh, appreciate that. Yeah. Well, this is just my normal lounge room. This is just uh, you know, this is how I roll. It's, uh, but uh, oh, it's 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 been really it's been really lovely. I've been just incredibly impressed with how adaptable people have been, particularly in the in in our industry. Um, it's it's been really heartening, and I've been um, I don't know just it's it's heartwarming to know uh, that in times of calamity and isolation, we've turned mm. to books uh as as a means of of making sure we still connect to each other i think that's been a really yeah. beautiful uh outcome of, of this obviously kind of awful event um and so you know things like this it's just a joy it's, it's lovely to be able to connect that's really that's a really nice way of putting it um i am just really sad so you've got a much more optimistic sunny outlook <laughs> than me because i remember avid and being there and having a drink and seeing everyone and everyone in the audience tonight meeting you in person but like you say this is still great and again really appreciate that we get to do this tonight with you um really excited for your new novel it's been out for like a week and a half two weeks now how long has it been on shelves bit, uh, i think a bit over a bit over two weeks or thereabouts yeah so it's pretty fresh it's very fresh yeah um yeah. can you would you mind introducing us because i'm sure there's some people in the audience who are yet to open that first page although of course you know what craig sylvie fans probably tore through this the moment they got it but um would you mind giving us a bit of an overview what is honeybee what is the story here for us of course yes uh honeybee uh tells the story of a young trans teenager who's called sam watson and we first meet sam late one night when she steps onto a quiet traffic overpass in the southern suburbs of perth and climbs over the rail and looks down at the road below with the intention of ending her life. But at the far end of the bridge, there is an old man and his name is Vic and he's smoking his last cigarette and he's there to end his own struggle. Um, but the two see each other across the void uh, and their fates are forever changed. Uh, they meet and mm. Honeybee is ultimately about the relationship that blooms between the two of them uh, and the efforts that they make to repair each other. Um, mm. Yeah, but despite the very grim and bleak beginnings of, of Honeybee, it really is a very hopeful and optimistic and life-affirming story. And it's all about the importance of support uh, and relationships and love and understanding and community. Yeah, I was, when I was reading, I was really struck by your ability to write um, uh, some of the, uh, you know, really traumatic, really difficult subject matter um, and just some of the things that um, happen to Sam or that she does to other people sometimes, like the trauma that she inflicts herself can be just so brutal. And yet we are just wrapped up in hope the whole time. It's not, it doesn't feel defeated, you know, despite, despite just some of the, um, some of such grim subject matter. Um, there's just such, like you say, love and hope and community and relationship in there. Um, how do you go about doing that in a way, I guess I want to ask how, how do you write trauma in a way that is sensitive? Because, you know, I, I've had struggles, but I haven't had struggles like Sam has had struggles. You know what I mean? And, and right. I related so much to so much of what she goes through. And I was just wondering how you frame her journey in a way and keeping in mind that when people read it, they'll be so affected by it. I just find right. it such an interesting subject. I was just wondering for your thoughts. Yeah. I, I think what's critical is acknowledging the, the gravity of that, of that trauma. Yeah. Um, I think the, the another part of that is uh, uh, the way that Sam describes her journey in, in mm. Honeybee. It's Sam's mm. voice. So mm. Sam uh, is a very different 
narrative voice to somebody like Charlie Buckton from Jasper Jones, for example, who is quite preternaturally talented. Um, you know, I grew up reading books, has aspirations to being a writer. Um, uh, and so in that respect is, is quite articulate for uh, his age. However, Sam has a very different background to, to Charlie. Sam comes mm. from quite a neglected place, a very isolated place, raised by a single parent uh, who's quite inconsistent, quite volatile. Uh, yeah. And so Sam's voice is, is singular. It's quite naive. It's quite raw. Um, and Sam is quite untruthful uh, with a lot of the other characters in Honeybee. Uh, mm. A little bit deceptive, uh, uh, just a little bit manipulative uh, for reasons that we uh, come to understand uh, are justifiable given the context of her life. Yeah, however, yeah. however, Sam never lies to us. She never lies mm. to the reader. She's very mm. honest in her narration. She's very mm. reliable. And so Honeybee almost feels quite confessional. It's very intimate. It's like a diary yeah, entry. Yeah, that's um, true. And so to have that trust with the reader, I think what that does is it amplifies our emotional connection with Sam, if we can trust her implicitly. And so I think that gives an extra gravity and power uh, yeah. to, to those scenes because we feel as though we're feeling them so strongly. Yeah. Um, however, I, 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 I will also say that in Honeybee, I wanted to capture how Sam feels. I wanted to capture and illustrate the emotional complexities um, of growing up uh, trans or gender diverse in Australia. And you touched on it earlier. This is not my lived experience. I don't navigate the world with the same pressures and threats and risks as mm, okay. somebody like Sam. And uh, I'm acutely aware that this is that, that Sam's story is not my lived experience. You know, yeah. I recognize too, that this is a privilege that I have and that this is unjust and unfair. And so what I, what it requires of an author in order to, capture an experience that doesn't emerge from their own history. Yeah. Uh, it's always been incredibly important to me uh, that uh, the ethical framework that underpins an approach is respectful and sensitive yeah. and careful and uh, collaborative. And uh, yeah, right. that's, that's the approach that I took. And so what I required were testimonies. Um, and that's what I collected. I read as widely as I could. We live in a time where some incredibly brave and inspiring people have publicly volunteered their stories for people like me to read on the internet. Uh, so I scoured uh, forum posts and websites and blogs and video logs. And, uh, and most importantly of all, I was able to connect with support networks like Transfolk of WA. Yeah. And, I'm, and I met with... Uh, a number of people in, in the trans and gender diverse communities uh, of various ages and backgrounds and histories um, who generously gave me their time and uh, shared their stories with me yeah. and yeah. Ans answered my many, many questions. Um, and it was that chorus of voices that uh, infused Sam's story or elements thereof. Yeah. Um, uh, there's nothing in Honeybee as it relates to dysphoria or Sam's gender identity that is left to invention. Every description thereof uh, is informed by my research and reportage. And in yeah. that sense, the, the collaboration I had with, uh, with those people um, was vital to shaping yeah, Honeybee. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It was it was their contribution that built helped to build this book, and yeah. I couldn't have written it without their without their uh, th that contribution. I couldn't have written it without uh, their enthusiasm, their encouragement, and their support. Um, and so I owe a great debt to those people. Yeah, and you, uh, like you like you say, you can really feel when you read the book. You can feel that care. You can feel that. Um, yeah. I guess that's the way I want to put it, that care and respect and that consideration and that collaboration. You can feel it in every sentence. Um, 
How have you found the response to the book? Like you, you, we were talking earlier about you've had some really great um, responses from people in the trans community in um, Western Australia. Um, can you tell us anything about some of the responses you've had from readers? Uh, it's, it's, it's a bit hard to describe, Ben. It's, uh, it's been phenomenal. It's quite astonishing. Um, a lot of people have come to this book. I'm receiving messages from people all over Australia. Um, uh, you know, it's been incredibly heartwarming and incredibly moving. I've heard from yeah. uh, a lot of people, particularly young people in uh, the trans and gender diverse community um, who uh, a number of whom have felt encouraged and galvanized and on the strength of reading this story have publicly declared who they are. And that's a really beautiful thing uh, and, and a really meaningful thing for me. Mm. Uh, I've met, I've met with people uh, having the, uh, the, the, the great fortune of being able to do physical events uh, here in Perth. Yeah. I've met with, I've met with people uh, who have bought, uh, members of the trans and gender diverse community who have bought Honeybee uh, to better connect with their families uh, oh, wow. so that they can understand their story and vice versa. Families have bought this for, for their trans and gender diverse kids. Um, I had a really moving chat with, uh, with a lady who came to my uh, launch event here in Fremantle uh, who has a trans son who used to love reading, but he stopped because he couldn't see anybody. He couldn't see himself in fiction. And it meant a lot that, uh, yeah. that, that she could buy this book for him and give it to him. And so he could see himself visible and represented uh, and accepted um, and recognized and respected and, and hopefully, uh, you know, encouraged and galvanized and that was the case I, I heard back from her the next day she, she went home uh gave her son the honeybee and he read it all night and uh, didn't stop until morning and so i i've received many many dozens of of, of uh responses like that and it's mm. just been uh quite incredible there's, there's there's no more gratifying no more rewarding uh uh, uh uh, testimony for, for, for me to field as an author. It's just been yeah. quite amazing. That's really awesome. I appreciate you sharing that with us because I can tell it's, it's moving to you. So I do appreciate that because um, it's really nice. And like you say, in this time of COVID where we have books that we can find uh, these little moments of humanity and those little things, little sparks um, in books and find ourselves there in, in more ways than we even knew possible. So appreciate you saying that. Um, can I ask, when you set out to write Honeybee, was it, it I don't know how to phrase this that well. It wasn't, I'm imagining it wasn't necessarily to tell a message. Like, I don't know whether that was part of the initial instinct to write it. Was it just to tell a story? I, I'd have to describe to you the events that, that uh, inspired yes. Honeybee. Yes, please um, do, yes because it's, it's often a question that's been difficult for me to, to answer. You don't, you're not always aware of where or why uh, an idea has occurred to you or where a story has ignited from. However, yeah. Honeybee's genesis actually stems from a real event. Um, the, the truth is that a few years ago now, my brother was picking up his partner from the airport and he was driving her home to Fremantle uh, where, where they live. And as he crossed the Canning Highway overpass, through the corner of his eye, he saw a young person standing on the wrong side of the rails and they were precariously poised. And so he pulled over uh, immediately and uh, he called the police uh, while my sister-in-law, whose name is Sam, she got out of the car and she approached this young person, but largely with the ambition just to distract them while help was on the way. Man. And so, yeah. And so after, after, that, yeah. Yeah. So after, after he, after my brother called the police, he contacted me and I was at home and I was working and, uh, uh, I was immediately, uh, connected to this moment. I was concerned and I was worried and I was heartbroken and, uh, he continued to give me updates. 
And so my sister-in-law connected with this young person and spoke with them and they talked about everything and nothing uh, yeah. until they, they volunteered the reasons why they were there. And they were struggling with issues surrounding their gender identity. Uh, they had lost the support of their family and their friends. They had been kicked out of home and they were alone in the world. And they'd found themselves in a very anguished, hopeless and helpless place. Mm. Uh, and so soon after the police turned up and they were quite brusque and businesslike, they grabbed this young person, dragged them back over the railing and just deposited them in the back of an ambulance. And my sister-in-law wasn't required to give a statement. She was just sort of summarily dismissed. Um, and so right. she drifted away from the scene and, uh, and that was that they drove away. And in the following days, the following days, we, uh, we tried to reconnect with this person. Uh, we tried to find them. We just wanted to check in, offer our support and, and see if we could help. But they had a very common name. And so we couldn't find them. They proved to be quite elusive. And so I was left with... A, a, very, a, a very real concern for a very real person. Uh, with a very real and urgent predicament who existed entirely in my imagination. You know, this person uh, that, that, that I had built. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to understand them better. And so uh, I started to, to listen. I started to read. I started to educate myself better on the, the pressures and the threats and the risks facing young trans and gender diverse people in Australia. Yeah. yeah. And... I was heartbroken by the testimonies that, that I collected, the stories that I read, and I was alarmed by many of the statistics that, uh, that I encountered. And when faced with things that I don't readily understand, things that feel abstract, that, that I want to try and clarify, my process has always been to want to write about it. And so I started shaping a character and shaping a story. And Honeybee is the, is the novel that emerged. And so to answer your question, my, my intentions in telling this story, first and foremost, was to honour that person on that bridge on that night. Mm. Not to tell their story, uh, but to honour them. Yeah. And what I wanted to describe as authentically and respectfully as I could were the emotional undercurrents, how it feels, the complexities um, and what I also wanted to offer was a notion of how to make it out, how yeah. a person like that can find hope. Yeah. And uh, this is the thematic undercurrent of honeybee. It's about support and love and understanding. It's about this fleet of characters who enter Sam's life and unconditionally offer themselves uh, to Sam. And, you know, it's within those relationships that Sam begins to change and Sam begins to hope and Sam sees herself uh, as she really is. And I think those yeah. relationships are, are, are critical. Yeah. Um, and beyond that, what my hopes and intentions are for Honeybee, as I mentioned earlier, if young trans and gender diverse people can pick this book up and see themselves visible and represented and respected. I think that is a really meaningful outcome, but beyond that for a broader readership, I think honeybee can offer an emotional context through which we can better understand uh, the, the challenges and the difficulties faced by young trans and gender di diverse people uh, in Australia. Um, and I think that yeah. can en enrich us. Yeah. Um, do, is, that, is that sort of what you feel like the role of um, fiction is or the role of the novel is like this, this type of empathetic education of people or this emotional charging of people? Is that the sort of, like, have you always thought that about fiction that it can sort of help people understand one another of course of course i mean it's i think it's impossible to be a reader 
and to read widely and to be an unempathetic, non-compassionate person. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it, is, it is where we learn to uh, connect to each other. Um, reading is a solitary act that makes us feel less alone. It's a really yeah. beautiful thing that, that we do. That transaction yeah. uh, between uh, a reader and a writer over that constellation of words yeah. changes us, you know? I think we are unburdened uh, by a story. We're vulnerable. The beautiful thing about books is that we set aside our own identities. When we are lost inside a story, we forget who we are, where we are, what time it is, and we enter a different space. We, to the best of our abilities, uh, see the world uh, as it is for other people. And it's a very yeah. profound, powerful exchange. And it, it cannot help but change us. It cannot yeah. help but connect us. And so I think it's uh, a vital thing. Books can be uh, really important agents of change. All right. Well, thank you, Craig. I appreciate that. I might steal a few of those things because that's, <laughs> I think you put that really, really well. Um, you were talking about some of the different characters. Um, can we go through a couple of these characters? Because my gosh, hmm. you, you, your ability to just the different voices and the different ways they act, they're so distinct. They're so vibrant and they're so interesting and they all have their own story and they all have their own journey i just i love all these characters can you tell us a little bit first of all Rip, who's a huge huge player in this novel um such a wonderful person like i just fell in love with vic what can you tell us about vic well first i can tell you that i love vic um i have such admiration for vic um you know it's interesting because in honeybee masculinity is for sam uh, treated as a threat. It's something to be feared. Masculinity is something of an antagonist in Honey Bee. However, in Vic, um, I think we see in the traditional sense, um, some of those more admirable traits of masculinity. Yeah, um, that's a good way uh, of putting it. Yeah, I like that. You know, he's very protective. He's, he's uh, a provider. He has a huge heart. I'm certainly not suggesting that, that you know, these aren't also... Uh, traits of femininity of course they exist however Vic um, he lives his life uh, by a set of moral laws that seems to be kind of yeah. codified in his behavior um, mm. which I think is really interesting and I think that you know it, it, it informs his decisions before anything else before want or desire um, and I think that's a really admirable thing but yeah. Vic is not Vic's not without his flaws, right? Um, you know, Vic is a widower. He lost his wife some years before and in doing so his whole world collapsed. Um, he's, a, he's a war veteran of Vietnam. And it's actually, it's through Edie's diaries. His departed wife, Edie, has left these diaries that Sam discovers. And she learns a lot about Edie. She learns a lot about Vic through these very intimate portraits. And in these diaries, uh, Edie describes Vic as a rock. She calls him a rock. And it's certainly true in the sense that he's very consistent and very resilient. It's quite hard. But it's also true in the sense that he is impermeable. Um, <laughs> he is very quiet, you know. Um, he, and I think this is very true of, of many men in that generation. I think it's very yeah. tr certainly very true of return servicemen. Vic, yeah. Vic suffers in silence, you know, and we get the sense that despite Vic and Edie's marriage being a really beautiful love story, um, there was a disconnect between the two of them because Vic just couldn't emote. And I think an interesting thing about Vic's relationship with Sam is that he's probably more honest with Sam than he has been yeah. with Edie. He confides in Sam. Um, Sam gets the blood from the stone, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, and, so and, it, and it, and it sort of, it, it ultimately, uh, becomes, you know, Vic's redemption, you know, he makes a very devastating confession. Um, and so I think Sam changes Vic. 
And I think, you know, I, I, have a, I have a lot of love and a lot of admiration for Vic and, and the, the relationship that, that the two have. Yeah, that's really well put. Um, can you also tell us a little bit about, I mean, there's so many cool characters. Um, how can we go past fellow Bits Gerald, whose name yeah. is amazing? Like, how can we go past um, fellow Bits Gerald? <laughs> what can you tell us about Bella? Right, well, um, so it's, it's Sam's ambition uh, before she dies to, to go to a drag show. Sam loves drag. Uh, drag has um, been a safe space for Sam. There are heroes in the drag community for Sam because they express uh, uh, themselves, their gender, um, mm. with so brazenly, without shame. And, you know, it's something, it, you know, it was, it was uh, an early inroad to Sam discovering who she really is. Um, and so it's, it's a place that she wants to be. And so Vic agrees to, to help Sam go to a drag show. And there are certain calamities that, that, that take place. Um, but in, in the lowest moment, Sam meets a drag queen uh, called Fella Bits Gerald. Um, and I have to tell you, Ben, it's not easy, mate, coming up with new drag names. Like, they are... They you had a Craig Sealy original. I thought you would have taken that from somewhere else. It's that good. Did you come up with that? Mate, when I came up with Fella Bits Gerald, I'm not even lying. I got out of my chair and just did, the, I did a bit of a fist pump. I was very happy with myself. Uh, I feel yeah. like that's where you stop for the day, like I've done, I'm going out on a high note. <laughs> it's enough, that's yeah. enough right there. Uh, yeah, yeah, I've got Fella Bits Gerald. Um, but Fella Bits Gerald is a character I feel that befits the name. Um, you know, she yeah. is, she immediately swoops Sam up um, under her care, becomes yeah. something of a, of a fairy drag mother, you know, um, uh, just loves Sam implicitly, sees a lot of herself in Sam, I think instantly recognizes where this kid has come from um, and that this kid needs the kind of support uh, that, that she has got or that, that fella has got um, from the, the drag community, the LGBT community, um, uh, from, from counsellors, et cetera, kind of implicitly knows the path yeah. that, that this kid needs to take um, and as gently as possible, you know? Um, That's one fella of the things with... Oh, sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. Just the, no. the way that fella perseveres and keeps on, keeps on after Sam, like it just is, is tenacious and keeps on knocking at the door and gets told to go away and just keeps on knocking. I just found that really admirable. Yeah, yeah. This, uh, and I think, I think it speaks to, to some of Fella's experience, both, both personal mm. and, and, and with other people that, 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 um, you know, that she knows. Um, fella is a, by, by day, is a nurse called Peter. Um, you know, and, and is uh, a very caring, nourishing, uh, wonderful person. Um, and, you know, it's one of those key relationships, I think, that just sweeps into Sam's life. And as you say, just, um, just the, despite having no reinforcement in, in, the, other, in the other direction, just <laughs> yeah, continues yeah. to support and love this character. And I think sometimes that's what we need. Yeah, mm, I absolutely agree. Um, I just want a quick reminder too, to anyone in the audience, um, we would love to have your questions for Craig just at the end. I think we're nearly, oh man, we're nearly out of time. What the heck? How did that go oh, so quickly? I um, do bang on. Yeah. <laughs> um, can, we, can we quickly talk about Aggie? Because I was saying to you before, I'm a high school teacher. Aggie is a teenage girl and the voice of Aggie and just the way she is, I pictured a you know, hundred Aggies um, I really love her. What can you talk about? Tell us about Aggie. Well, I love Aggie. And also, yeah. Sorry, and also the role yeah. she plays in, in yeah. Sam's life. Totally. Yeah, well, first of all, I just love Aggie. And I'm, and I'm pleased that, uh, you know, you, you have the, a, a similar connection. Um, yeah. She was a joy, just a joy to write. She's a very vivacious, um, charismatic, opinionated, uh, fully formed, whip smart uh geeky character who <laughs> again just sees sam and just uh almost doesn't give sam a choice they're best friends from the get-go yeah um and yeah I, uh, she expresses herself so volubly um and quite distinctly um mm. and i think that i think that just makes her you know unique you know um yeah i i, I love uh 
the dialogue of, of funny people and distinct people. I love, uh, we mentioned privately, you know, I, I really adore uh, new slang and new patterns of speech. Um, yeah. And so, you know, infusing uh, contemporary characters with those is just a, is a really interesting thing for me to do. Um, but I think Aggie, I, her last name is Mima Duma. Um, that I think Aggie and her family, the Mima Dumas, provide a real contrast for Sam. Yeah. So they, Aggie lives a few houses down from Vic and, and Sam goes to stay with Vic in a suburban street in the southern suburbs of Perth. Um, you know, very middle to lower class, basically. Um, and Aggie immediately, within minutes of meeting Sam, has invited Sam into the Mima Duma house. And for Sam, who has grown up in one bedroom apartments, uh, you know, uh, quite insecure addresses at, at several points has had to, uh, you know, live in the car. Um, this is exotic terrain, just a simple yeah. suburban house. And the way that this quite nuclear um, uh, supportive family operates is almost mystifying to, to Sam. Yeah. Just the simple, just the simple fact that Aggie wants to be her friend um, is something that, that Sam can't quite wrap her head around. You know, she's mm. never had a friend before. And so uh, in some respects, she, she resists it because she feels as though she's not deserving of, of someone like Aggie. She lies a little bit about her background in order to not scare Aggie away. She's yeah. tentative with that relationship. Um, but again, as, as is the case with Vic, as is the case with Fella Bits Gerald, as is the case with other supporting cast, like quite literally a supporting cast, um, Aggie just will not let Sam go. Um, mm. There's a connection there. And, uh, you know, it is, I think, I know I'm banging on a little bit, but I think, the no, most no, important, I think the most important thing that Aggie gives Sam is perspective. Because often when we're alone and we're in dark places, we tend to fall into patterns and traps of our thinking, um, yeah. which, which, don't, which kind of contaminate our notion of who we are. And so Sam uh, has a very low sense of self-worth and esteem. Yeah. Doesn't think she's worth much. Doesn't think she's worth fighting for or persevering for. But Aggie does something really interesting. Aggie is uh, obsessed with Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, uh, loves it and um, what they have in Dungeons and Dragons when you start a new match because I've done more than enough research on D&D &D now and loved it um, but when you start a, a new game or a new match you you fill out a, a character sheet with yeah. uh, all sorts of attributes for any given character um, and what Aggie does is fills out a character sheet for Sam and it allows Sam to see herself as she truly is for the very first time. Mm -hmm. And what that does is uh, uh, allows us to see that maybe some of her thinking has been toxic. Um, and yeah, it sort of cuts through and, a bit. Yeah, and it allows her to value herself, you know? And it's one yeah. step in, in the pathway out of where she has been. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Um, and just, uh, we might just finish on this one just before we open up to questions, Craig. Um, speaking of um, a lot of the, the insecurity and the, uh, the sense of shame and um, all the things that Sam walks around with and lives with daily, um, a lot of that is sort of illuminated in light of her relationship with her mother. Um, I guess I want to ask just, what can you say about that relationship between the two? Cause it's not, I, I don't want to paint it like it's like, it's this awful thing. It's not, it's got love in there too. It's got hope, but it's also difficult. And her mum is a, a person too. And I, yeah, just what can you tell us about crafting that relationship and just what you found in that? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, Sam's mother is called Sarah and Sarah had Sam when she was quite young. And Sarah is quite, immature, quite selfish, uh, and has issues with substance abuse, um, and, uh, and, uh, you know, has almost patterns of disorder in her behavior. And it makes her a very inconsistent mother. 
There's no yeah. question. There's no question that Sarah loves Sam. Um, yeah. But this is demonstrated in a really inconsistent way for Sam when she's growing up. She'll flood Sam with love and overwhelm her and then retract it uh, and then be gone for large tracts of time and Sam is left on her own. And this is really confusing for, for kids, you know, at formative ages. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, they, or they almost always blame themselves. Um, and what, what it means is, given that Sam is so isolated, is that this person, this inconsistent person, is someone that she orbits around and has this very strong, strident, almost toxic loyalty to. Um, because her mother is her world, her absolute yeah. world. Um, and so, you know, when, Sam, uh, when Sarah gets a new partner called Steve, who has all manner of issues on his own part, um, there's, there's a schism in that relationship and it causes friction between the two of them. Um, but it's also by virtue of the fact that Sam has, to, Sam has a period of time away from her mother for the first time in her life, sees how other relationships work, um, sees how other people love and value each other. Um, what that offers Sam, again, is a bit of perspective and uh, it ultimately informs uh, the, the, again, the, the, the pathway that Sam takes as it relates to her relationship with her mother. Yeah, thank you for that, Craig. I appreciate all your answers. Um, do, Emma, do we have any questions from the, the chat that we'd like to read out? Yeah, yeah, we've had a few questions come through, actually, so I'll get through as many as I can. Um, we've sure. still got a few minutes, so it should be okay. If you've got any more that you'd like to send through, please do. Um, I'll start with a question from Georgia. There's a few questions within it, actually. Um, so when you were first dreaming up this book, what idea came to you first? And Georgia says, I'm interested to know whether the school play with the honeybee was one of the initial ideas or if that came later. And then she asks, why a honeybee? I love this scene so much. Um, great. That's a great question, Georgia. Um, and, and thank you. Uh, yeah, I, it, Honeybee was initially conceived uh, as a one-act play. Um, I, I conceived of a sort of suspended stage uh, where two characters, Vic didn't exist at that stage, uh, it was another person, uh, and they slowly connected over, over time. And, uh, you know, this character who was a, 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 a different version of Sam at that stage, um, you know, slowly unraveled their life as they got closer. Um, and I actually sent that play to uh, a friend of mine, Kate Mulvaney, who is a brilliant playwright. So I might as well go straight to the best. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, 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 look, the truth is I, I, I'm better leaving theatre to the thespians. You know, I'm no playwright by any stretch. Um, but she indicated to me that there was more there. There was more substance in, in that story. Uh, there was a lot in that backstory and she just wanted to know more. Uh, and so I kicked around for a little while thinking about it thinking about the best way to access this story and, and, uh, and how Sam's story might best be told. And it was only when I had this very contrasting character emerge in Vic, um, who was there for the same reason, that's when I had my novel. That's when I had the story. That was when I felt as though I had something substantive enough uh, to, to, to work on. Um, I, I can't remember the second part of that question, unfortunately, I'm not sure what it was. Um, Oh, sorry. The second part was um, why a honeybee, and I, uh, George, uh, George just said I love the scene um, of the play and of making the costume so much. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I, I, I don't want to go into that uh, too far. Unfortunately, for those people who haven't read the book, it's um, uh, you know it, it sort of imbues that third act, and we we wonder who honeybee is or or, or why that's such a theme in the book. Um, uh, so uh, maybe I could describe it to you privately, Georgia. I'm, I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, I don't want to uh, speak too much about that. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, we've had we've had lots of people who are who are complimenting the work and who have clearly already read the book. But I know that our audience is a mixture of people who are reading and haven't yet read everything. So I'm trying to pick out the spoilers. So yeah, just flag anything for me. <laughs> if it is. Sorry, <laughs> I haven't yet managed to manage to read um, a copy yet, but um, I certainly will be. So we've had. Um, Ruben, who has just 
who just dropped out, but I believe that they are back with us now. Um, so Ruben has said, this is such a uniquely heartwarming read. Um, I'm wanting to ask, um, you mentioned your process of having real testimonies inform the story and your awareness of sensitivity and the consciousness of representation. It sounds like this story um, is quite ethic, was quite ethically challenging to write. Did you have any major moments of doubt um, or were you worried about misre misrepresentation, exploitation, etc.? Um, and how did you overcome these moments or any critical responses that you received? Yeah, look, I, I, I think I acknowledge that uh, most traditional media representations of trans people uh, have been dominated by cisgendered writers. And I recognise that many of those have been exploitative damaging, uh, harmful, and degrading. Um, and in recognizing that, uh, I saw Honeybee as an opportunity to, to do better. And I understand why there might be caution that accompanies the fact that I have written this story. And uh, I, uh, I feel as though I do have a responsibility to speak to my credentials as an ally and to reassure readers that my approach has been ethical and it has been very respectful and consultative. And so with that underpinning my process and with uh, consulting with members of the trans and gender diverse community, um, you know, I was able to uh, approach this work uh, via the, the rigid framework that, that I had set that I felt it would be ethical. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I, it's not a question of me having doubt for my process because I made certain to speak to people about what not to do, about what was important, about uh, what trans and gender diverse people uh, felt was, was critical in, in representing uh, stories uh, about trans and gender diverse people. Um, it's important to note also, I think that uh, it's not my intention uh, in writing Honeybee is to, to, to present some kind of definitive account of growing up transgender. Because uh, if there's anything that emerged from my research, it's that everybody's experience is different. Such a thing doesn't exist. All I can attend to is Sam's very specific story in a very specific time and a very specific place under a very specific set of pressures and circumstances. And that's all that I've, uh, uh, that I've tried to attend to. Um, however, in, in liaising with and listening to members of the trans and gender, gender diverse, diverse community, um, I have ensured that uh, any depiction or any emotional illustration uh, has been uh, as accurate and authentic as, as it could possibly be. Lovely, thank you. Um, we've had another question. Um, which was your favourite character to write um, for this book and across your other books as well? Is there a top mm -hmm. character? Oh my goodness. It's, t it's like trying to choose your favorite child or something. You know, you, you always have one, but you don't want to say it in public. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I just love Sam. I just really do. I feel so connected to Sam. Um, I, I, I still worry for Sam. I still just very, very deeply love Sam. And I still consider the fact that Sam is deeply worthy of love. Um, I feel as though I got to know her um really quite intimately and so um you know i i think about her a lot and 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 i hope for her um so i, I think i think it's i think it's just sam yeah um verity is, uh, has said um that the cover is wonderful did you have any inputs into it or was it a surprise for you as well uh i i am a bit of a, a maniac and so I tend to be quite involved with, uh, you know, some of the behind the scenes uh, elements of publishing and cover design is one of them. Um, uh, Lisa, our cover designer is brilliant. She's just uh, so, so talented and so generous in that she was uh, more than happy to field my 30 page mood board that I sent through of, of cover design ideas, et cetera. Um, but we did have a curious situation with Honeybee actually. Um, we had a cover design and it was beautiful. It was great. Um, however, we couldn't get 
a clearance from that model uh, for our cover design. And so uh, it was a bit of a race against time to develop a new cover. And we couldn't find any stock images that fit. And so what we ended up doing was uh, in the midst of the COVID madness, setting up a photo shoot over here in Perth. And we actually found a, a local uh, actor or model. He actually lives in Fremantle. Um, and we set up a photo shoot with an enormously talented photographer called Daniel James Grant. And uh, we, we took this photo uh, just a few months ago, actually. Um, and as soon as we saw this shot, we just knew that, that it was the one. It felt, it felt so perfect, so dramatic, so iconic. Um, and uh, yeah, from there on, it was Lisa's brilliant work. Great, thank you. And I'll finish with a question that a couple of people have been asking in, in two forms. Are you writing anything at the moment and um, what's your next? Uh, so like, are you working on anything short and, and are you working on another novel? So no rest, Craig, for you. <laughs> no, not at all, not at all. Mostly I'm just banging on about myself at the moment. Um, however, uh, I will say that um, fortunately, um, uh, some producers are circling uh, and uh, there's a lot of interest in Honeybee. Um, it's looking as though uh, it may well be a, a series drama adaptation. Uh, so we, we may, uh, my, and uh, given that I wrote the adaptation for Jasper Jones and I really adore working in film, it's looking like uh, I'll be a large part of uh, developing Honeybee for television. So maybe writing a few episodes and executive producing and, and being a part of that process. So that'll be next, I think. Awesome. Thank you. Um, well, those are all the questions that we've had come through and we are very nearly out of time. So I would like to um, thank you all for attending tonight. I would like to thank you, Craig, and also Ben for a wonderful discussion. Um, do either of you have any final questions or comments that you would like to make before I open up the Zoom room so that everybody can join me um, in saying thanks to you both? Uh, oh, look, for, for me, I just want to thank everybody uh, for, for their support and for tuning in tonight. It means the world. Uh, as Ben mentioned, um, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that uh, circumstances don't permit me to, to be over there and, and being with you in person. I would love that to be the case. Hopefully next year sometime we can reconnect. But I, I genuinely do want to thank each and every one of you for supporting my work uh, and, and believing in this story and for being here tonight and, and lending me your ears. It really means the world. So thank you. Um, and if I can just uh, also say, I just really appreciate you, Craig, and just how um, I, would, I would say vulnerable you've been tonight to talk to us and really open up um, emotionally to us. So we just really appreciate um, how authentic a person you are. So thank you for being with us. And thank you for thank writing you, the book too. Thank you so much. That means a bunch. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'll take everybody off mute now. It may take a couple of moments for your microphones to come off, so bear with me. But you should now all be able to be heard and to thank us, to thank Craig and Ben for tonight's discussion. Most people are still on mute. Sorry, I don't know what Zoom's doing at the moment. <laughs> thank you so much, everybody. Have a lovely thank evening. You. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.